doctrines. Don't step on a dragon's tail. Don't preach prophecy. Don't preach this. An evangelical Adventist church. And, 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 and so therefore, our pastors are under pressure. It's just hard to be a pastor. If you're 60 years old and you're going to retire, they put up with you. But if you're a young pastor today getting into it, you're under a lot of pressure because you're out of the ministry if you just move out, of, if you step wrong. So right now, expect the very best and the very worst to be at the same time in a church. You'll see Satan coming out of his hiding place and you'll see God pouring his spirit out at the same time. So don't judge the church in general. Just, re just realize there's a polarization and very soon when a crisis comes, everybody who's not on the right side is out of the church, just like that. It's going to happen very soon. We don't have to put up with it very much longer. Ellen White said that there was this terrible crisis that was going to take place, and all the lights went out. And then after that, then... It's not just Senator Bright. She told, she told one of the elders, uh, if you can read the train station vision, she didn't write it. Somebody, one of the, she related this story to one of the church leaders, and he wrote it down. We have a copy at my house. I don't remember the name of the church leader, but if you call our house, we can get a copy. She told him that the crisis that was coming, every single... Adventist disappeared. There wasn't one single one left. And she said, then as the dust settled, all of a sudden, one by one by one, God's true children started coming out of hiding. It's like everybody fled and abandoned Jesus, right? He said, there was nobody left. Yeah, yeah, and that's why she related it and he related it. But anyway, he spent a lot of time with Elon G. White and she said, pretty soon they started appearing. And the interesting thing, she said, there were no shepherds among that group. They had to find their own shepherds. So this is very scary. I, I consider myself a shepherd. And she said there wasn't any shepherds among those that came, that came back together after the crisis. It's, exactly the same scenario as it's the same scenario as what she said the other. In other words, all the lights went out. And when you look around, the entire church disappeared. And all of a sudden, one here, one there, one there, one there, pulling together and saying we're going to stand firm no matter what. And then the Holy Spirit is poured out on them and then there's an explosion that takes place. And all of God's children on the outside, it's now safe to bring them in. But the crisis that's coming will be a sudden and unexpected uh, disaster. Sudden and unexpected, that means it could happen today. And that's going to cause the crisis. So let's be, let's be standing alert and let's get ready. In giving all of our giving God ownership of all of our belongings. Uh, my interpretation is that includes our family, ourselves, our life. We're giving him everything. And I just wanted your perspective on that. Yeah, okay. Yes, uh, first of all, you have to recognize that God placed their family. You didn't give life to your family. He placed them in your possession uh, to care, to be care for them, right? And so therefore, we cannot be possessive. Like, in other words, we need to realize that we are to be re the most responsible, loving care of our family for right training and right discipline, but eventually the final person in control is God. And if he takes them from us, he has a right to lay them to rest. He has a right to call the shots in their lives. So I have to give God the ultimate authority in my wife's life. If God asks my wife to do something, I have to say, you're in control. She belongs to you. If she feels convicted, if she needs to do something, so I should, not be over, I should not be controlling of her spiritual life. We should help each other, help each other, build each other up. And yet, at the same time, the lines of control ultimately rest not in my hands, but in God's hands. So that I, I release the ownership of my family to my Heavenly Father, who's ultimately responsible to preserve them, and I pray for them, and God can deal with them. Uh, on our personal assets, uh, there's no doubt whatsoever that God should have total control of them. He owns them whether we say he does or not. And he can take them from us anytime he wants to. So therefore, my job is to say, I recognize your ownership and lordship. Tell me what you want me to do. And if that dream is correct that we, Sister White saw, right now, God is asking Seventh-day Adventists to move toward poverty. He's asking Seventh-day Adventists to let go, let go, let go, and put it into his work as he impresses them. Because someday, very soon, we will lose it all anyhow. The tragedy of it is, many will lose massive amounts of resources and it will come down like a mountain to crush them because they would say, if only I knew. Well, they could have known. They never asked. So uh, what a joy will be when that crisis happens, when you have already liquidated your assets and put into God's work under his orders, and you will say, all my assets have been turned into souls. All my treasures are in heaven. I have nothing left. Neither does anybody else have anything left. But I don't have anything to lose. 
You see, it's a wonderful thing not to lose anything. And so therefore, um, instead of having it taken from you by force or losing it through a catastrophe, it's better to, for God to prepare you in, in an orderly manner, dispose of your assets until finally you're just hanging on to God and suddenly the crisis happens, nobody has anything, but you didn't lose anything. So that's what God is doing with his people today. And I feel sorry for those that are wealthy. I have no idea what they're going to do. I just spoke two weeks ago in Collegeville Academy, and there is a couple billionaires sitting in there. What, what does a billionaire do? Now, I have friendship with some of them, and they're talking, they're looking, they're asking the right questions. Praise the Lord for that. Others are hostile to the idea. They like being billionaires. I have no idea. What does a billionaire do at the very last, when everything's going to close down? I can't even imagine the value of souls. They could turn billions of souls in. This is a big responsibility. Being rich right now is one of the most horrible things I can think of right now to me because you've got to give account for all of that. It's like buried treasure. And you're going to bury your talents. And having, having a business worth billions and not using it for mission and losing it all, that is such a heavy responsibility. If you all are able to move toward liquidation, as God tells you, and slowly getting leaner and leaner and leaner until the time is that you walk away from everything, you are among the very most fortunate and blessed. Those of you that have accumulated over a period of time, this is a big responsibility. Take it before God and fall on your face and ask Him to lead you and help Him to tell you because you don't have too much time left. It's almost too late. It's almost too late. It, the day will come very soon when you're going to give money to some missionary and nobody will want to even use it. You'll give me a $20 bill and I'll say, nobody will change it. I don't know how to spend it. Nobody will take it. What about 20000 I just got a $150,000 gift for Romania. A Romanian doctor in Loma Linda gave us 150000 to pay for the satellite uplink that's going to send a signal in Romania. We got a license. They, the government hasn't given a license to anybody, not even the millionaires. They just became part of the European community. Everybody wants licenses within that European community because they're special privileges. And we got it in 15 minutes. We turned in our application, and 15 minutes later, they gave it to us. And there's millionaires sitting up, billionaires sitting outside waiting for a license. No, no, no. Well, we've been praying for the license, and now we got 150000 to buy the dish, the, some equipment to put it up. And you know what? I told the doctor, I said, I'm glad you did it now, because if you'd have done it in six months from now, I can't guarantee that it's even possible, because it's going so rapidly down. Uh, just from between now and last year, the U.S. dollar can buy one can only, it's only worth two-thirds of what it was worth a year ago in Europe and in South America. The gasoline in, in Brazil, the, it's gone from three, three reales per dollar down to 1.9 reales per dollar. It's one-third right across the dot. It, it, it's not worth very much anymore. Very soon, it's going to be worth less, half, fourth, one-eighth, one-tenth, nothing. And, and so you can see that he was happy. He, said, he only told me, he said, uh, I'm just glad that I gave it to you. He said... Did you realize this is not even a sacrifice for me? I don't even have to think twice about this money. I'm not sacrificing anything, David. This is extra money for me. Imagine, there's people that can give 150000 without even thinking twice, and there's no sacrifice involved. He said, I only wish that I could learn how to sacrifice. He goes, be praying for me. You see, there's a spirit coming into the church. God is beginning to lead his people to actually enjoy Giving and sacrificing. If you give without sacrifice, it's a wonderful thing, but you don't get the same reward as if you sacrifice. When you sac do it through sacrifice, there's a greater joy level. If, if you give, you, if you give a, a beggar 10 cents, what joy level is there for you? Huh? Do you get joy out of giving a beggar 10 cents? But if you help somebody go to the hospital and pay for their hospital bill and it kind of was a little hurt you a little bit, it's kind of like when they're healed and they go home, you go, yes! So you, you, there's a difference in joy. Okay. Another question? Well, <laughs> I guess it's like she said, we're tired. Uh, fine. <laughs> <laughs> we're tired. <laughs> oh, they're just tired, no question. Well, you're welcome. Um, it's been a privilege being with you, and, uh, um, I guess our phone number and other things are on those DVDs you took if you need to call sometime. Oh, here's a question. Right here. <laughs>